<laughs> thank you, Eric, and thank you for your patience, everyone, and welcome this, to the uh, spring 2023 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Lecture Series, where we talk to various luminaries in the world of design, art, the sciences, and today we're going to be talking to somebody from uh, the works in social work and disability studies uh, here at Lehman. Um, although this semester, if you've been following along with the past two lectures, you know that we're focusing specifically on design through a queer lens. Uh, and that means queer representation in the, in, within the design industry, uh, without the design industry, like how the products of the design industry include or serve queer and non-binary users and, and see the audiences and make them feel seen. This series is uh, running concurrently with the Lehman College Art, Art Gallery's current exhibition, Queer Love, Affection and Romance in Contemporary Art, which presents paintings and photographs that uh, illuminate both individual and universal stories of vulnerability, tenderness, and desire in the LGBTQIA plus community. It's, it closes on April 28th, so please um, make it your business to get there to see it. Also, this lecture is a, a component of an interdisciplinary LGBTQI plus design course. It's running right now. The students are here. Kevin, who's helping us out, I, I, I'm imagining is one of them. <laughs> Kevin did, did the troubleshooting before. Um, and this course is focusing on issues uh, in, in the queer and non-binary world as it relates to design. Uh, these students are here today, as I said, and they'll be interacting with us hopefully through the Q&A. Uh, also, this series is open to the public, so uh, anyone's welcome to ask questions. Uh, we love including questions from everyone about our topics. It's a, it's a good way to, to spread the, the conversation out. And now, finally, I'll introduce our guest today. Uh, Danny Lucchese is an adjunct faculty member in both philosophy and now in the art department at Lehman College. They began teaching at Lehman in the spring of 2021. Additionally, additionally, Professor, Professor Lucchese has taught in both the BA and MA in Disability Studies programs at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Uh, formerly, Professor Lucchese has taught in the Sociology Department at the CUNY College of Staten Island and the BA in Disability Studies program at William Patterson University. They are currently pursuing their doctorate in higher ed at the University of Arizona, examining uh, access to higher education, focusing on disabled and gender expansive students by mixing traditional academic practices with artistic modalities. Uh, Pro Professor Lucchese graduated from Wagner College with their BA in sociology uh, and a double minor in journalism and English lit in 2014. They earned their MA in disability studies from CUNY SPS School of Professional Studies in 2016 and their MA in sociology with a minor in design studies from the New School for Social Research in May of 2020. And that's sort of why they're here to talk about some of the design work they've done and how it relates to queer identity, uh, the lived experience of queer and non-binary people. So welcome, Danny. Thank you so much. For, I'm glad we got you here and all the technical issues are past us. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Dave, for inviting me to participate yeah. in this series. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in and apologies for the technological glitches. But of course, we wouldn't be in the Zoom universe without those. Um, so I wanted to actually start us off by diving into part of my work. As um, Dave has mentioned, I combined the modalities of spoken word and more traditional academic methods. So I actually wanted to get us thinking about these things by performing one of my pieces. So when I was at the new school, I took a class on visual, spatial, and material politics. And we were not allowed to write traditional papers, which of course, when you tell an academic that we're like, well, what do we do? Um, so at the 11th hour, as this project is due, as I'm sure many of the students on here can relate to as deadlines are creeping up, um, when my professor's like, so what are you gonna do with this project? I was like, I'm gonna do a spoken word piece and I'm gonna perform it for you all as my final presentation. And I realized I had stuck my foot in my mouth because I hadn't performed a spoken word in like, a nice decade before that. Um, but I was like, okay, well, I told them this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm going to do, I guess. And um, 
my projects uh, looked at the politics behind doors and how they help us create and construct spaces in terms of who, who is allowed into these spaces, who is allowed out or excluded from these spaces. Um, and when I proposed this project initially, my one of my professors who shall remain nameless, um, my initial idea she told me was so boring that I might as well study the politics of doors. So that's, I was like, okay, my professor wants the politics of doors, I'll give her the politics of doors, no problem. Um, so that is where this spoken word piece came from. So I'm going to actually turn off my camera temporarily um, because I want you all to focus on the piece itself and listening rather than myself. Um, so I am just going to dive into, without further ado, door politics. It's time to discuss door politics. Who's allowed in, who gets out, who has access, access denied, open doors, closed doors, locked doors, specified doors, where's the automatic doors? These are door politics. What would you do if you couldn't get into or out of a door? If it can find you like a caged lion at a zoo, if the sonic booms of its slam rip through you like a box cutter penetrates a package, like a force field that no matter how many times you try to go through, you bounce right back to where you started. These are door politics. In second grade, I began puberty, common with my disability. My teacher had the privates talk with my classmates. I had to stand in front of the classroom. The door closed my body, a spectacle to be dissected. These are door politics. In third grade, my teacher closed the door, called my name, and informed the class that I was stupid and should be held back. She said I wouldn't make it out of high school, and if I did, college would never be an option. The door to higher education locked. I had the key, but my brain was too foggy and I couldn't see it. These are door politics. In sixth grade, there was a day that my history teacher was absent. With the substitute teacher shortage and no one to cover, my principal stepped in. Why are you here, he asked. I have no idea, I replied. I had finally found the key. The door to special education was unlocked and I was free. These are door politics. When I was a first semester college student, my professor pulled me into her office and shut the door. We were discussing eugenics in class. She begged me to speak, begged for a syllable. The classroom door shuts. A classmate shares that he believes disabled people were a waste of life. My hand shot up, tamering through the silence, my words cutting into him like a machete, ripping him apart until he stood silent. Class dismissed. I walked out, shutting the door behind me. These are door politics. In the spring semester of my sophomore year, I enrolled in a class called Growing Up Female. The professor asked what did you learn about what it meant to be female? I penned a tale of being bullied into femininity as a disabled girl. Makeup covered my face like a mask, concealing every lie I ever told myself. Fat, ugly, stupid, locking myself in my room, convinced I wasn't deserving of friends of existence. Like how society constructs their doors, who gets in, who leaves? Like a sorting toy that calls for round blocks when all you have is square. Your identity doesn't fit into society's expectations like a key that doesn't fit the lock. So why impose limitations? These are door politics. As an English minor, I studied fairy tales and fantasy. So many magical doorways, magical access, but not unless you changed who you are. Alice had to change her size. Coraline opened a door to a brick wall. Harry Potter had to dream up his own room of requirement. Door whose literal talent was to open any door doesn't even have complete access. I thought literary doorways didn't discriminate. Yet even they seem to dictate who has access. These are door politics. My disabled friends and I were often told that higher education was our door to freedom, to opportunity. Yet all we seem to do is encounter locked doors. Doors only accessible via tunnel, tunnels that look like they're from an episode of SVU, doors that need to be automatic so we can make it to class. Yet we had to fight with the dean of the school for a year before two automatic door buttons were installed. Doors that display large yellow silhouettes of a woman, a man, and a wheelchair user, disabled and gender non-conforming, go together when your bladder needs relief, when you don't identify as man or woman, when you can't make it past the step leading into the conforming bathroom to everyone's disbelief. These are door politics. In the fall of 2017, three months into my new school journey, I fell and broke my knee. Each door to the new school struggled to open. I had to wait for someone to open every door to allow me to hobble through on crutches, where, why are there no automatic doors? I guess I didn't need to be concerned with those when I had a variety of male professors and students willing to assist the disabled damsel in distress. These are door politics. 
Last spring, my professor viewed disabled as a bad word, differently abled, she'd insist, shutting the door literally and figuratively on my identity, but she asked me my preferred pronoun. She wanted to be inclusive of my gender. They, them, my, my preferred pronouns are they, them. And for the millionth time, the word is disabled, not differently abled, like a door whose hinges are loose, still usable until the door breaks off from the hinges. She didn't even think she was exclusionary until course evaluations, door slammed on exclusion. These are door politics. It's time to discuss door politics, who's allowed in, who gets out, who has access, access denied, open doors, closed doors, locked doors, specify doors, where are the automatic doors? These are door politics. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, I wanted to begin with spoken word to kind of throw us into what design might look like for her queer people, or in my case, queer and disabled people. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and make it a little less cluttered. So give sure. me one second. Of course. Got a lot of technology. These I, I was speaking of technology, I put in my headphones. You can still hear me, right? Yes. Oh, excellent. Or at least I can. Don't know about everyone else. <laughs> I'm, I'm just afraid to, to make any moves here and possibly ruin everything. And that's understandable. Or right, hopefully you can all see my screen and it doesn't turn like seven different colors or something. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I want us to get into thinking about designing with a queer audience in mind. Um, so as I gave you a preview into door politics, um, I want us to also think about designing queer spaces. So for me in that particular project that meant doors, but spaces are not obviously just defined by doors. Um, so I want us to really engage with our own spaces. So I'd imagine that since we're all on Zoom, chances are we're either somewhere on Lehman's campus or maybe in our own homes. Um, so I want you to very briefly examine the space you're currently in. So whether it be your office, your bedroom, your home office, maybe you're in a Dunkin' Donuts that has Wi-Fi. I want you to think about what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you feel. And if you're in your own space, I want you to think about how you designed your space. So who was in mind and in the forefront when you designed the space? Was it you and only you? Was it you and maybe some aging parents? Was it you and your queer partner? Um, and I want you to think about why, how intentional or non-intentional did you design your space? Think of color, think of doors, think of the furniture or lack thereof, think of what may be behind you or to the sides of you or in front of you. Um, and then I want us to think about how we might queer this design if it's not already there. So I want us to think about this as we move forward. I don't know if anyone wants to share anything in the chat or the Q and A about their particular space and what they're noticing. Or Dave, you're more than welcome to chime in. Well, yeah, I mean, I was actually it's 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 funny because the art department. I don't know like how often you've walked past the Fine Arts Building here at Lehman, but it happens to be a Marcel Breuer uh, designed building. So he was a Bauhaus artist, um, a modernist, right? And I, the thing about modernist architecture is that um, it was not designed with uh, longevity or functionality in mind <laughs> necessarily. They were, they were, they are, and were works of art um, and culture, which is one of the great things about them. Um, on the other hand. Um, this building was designed in prime first as a library, a giant open air, you know, open space library. And Breuer, in order to get the roof um, to be supported without walls, right, he had to build these, he had to design these three, like almost umbrella shaped things that swoop in and hold up the roof from above so that it could mostly be an open concept. Um, and which is beautiful, but then uh, sometime in the 80s during the city's fiscal crisis, they put up walls in that whole space to make more use of the, the space here for the fine arts building and make it the fine arts, not the library. The library is moved to another building. 
which happens to be a brutalist um, cement structure, another modernist uh, invention. But um, because of the weird, uh, unique umbrella shape, there's like water leaking in whenever it rains, yep. which is a typical modernist architecture, uh, Beth de Noir, it's, it's, it happens all the time in a lot of these buildings. Um, and, but, but more importantly, I think to your point, the, the, the space here, like there are, there is an elevator. It's extremely difficult to get to. I know that because I used to have to cart stuff around as part of my job. And in order to cart stuff, you'd have to cart stuff from one side of the building over to the elevator, get it down the elevator, go to the back to where you are. It's, uh, there's st stairs everywhere that are not handicap, handicap accessible. Um, there's there's like a lot of doors. My office is it's just a box, but it's like you know you have to get around tables. Even I have trouble as just a you know I can walk uh, well around these tables. I can move out of the way, but I have trouble getting to my office. I can't imagine what it's like for somebody who has a disability, is in a wheelchair or in a like has a crutch or something like that. So uh, it's it's got some issues where. And really the issue is that it was form over over function when the building was designed. So that's what I would say. I Now I'm interested though, is what does it mean to queer a, a, a building design or a space design? When you say that, like, what do you mean exactly? So essentially when I invite us all to think about what we used to say in the new school as queering space, I want us to think about, of course, first and foremost, if it's an inviting space for LGBTQ individuals, no matter where they identify on the spectrum, right. but also how are we constructing those spaces? Because one thing that many of us will know as human beings, if I polled you all or asked you all, none of us hold one single identity and none of us hold one single identity at one specific time, right? So sure. I'm always both a disabled and a queer individual at any given moment. So just because let's say a space is physically accessible for my needs, which include me using a walker for long distance, doesn't necessarily mean I'm waltzing into a space that's LGBTQ friendly and will accept my non-binary gender identity as well. So first and foremost, is it inviting? And then secondly, is the design also queering and inviting? So is it a space that's literally in the way that it's designed LGBTQ friendly. For example, are there safe zone stickers on the offices of faculty, right? So if I'm walking in as a queer student, is my advisor a safe person to go to, mm -hmm. right? Do they acknowledge my identity? Will they respect my identity? Um, you know, am I walking into spaces where queer culture is known and celebrated? So for example, um, when I walk into my local pride center, I'm originally from Staten Island, we have various flags around the office. Um, we have various um, LGBTQ historical posters and pictures hanging up, right? So everyone who walks in will know who Marsha P. Johnson is, for example, right? They'll know about Stonewall, they'll know about queer history. Mm -hmm. Um, so really just thinking about the spaces that we're in and how we, through design on various levels, both physically and not, engage or not engage with particular people and invite them or disinvite them into the spaces. It, it seems like something that as a cisgender, you know, white man, to like the, uh, the initial reaction is, well, we don't have things like that for you know, there are no there are no safe stone zickers or pride flags or necessarily memorabilia specific to being cisgender. But then, as I've come to learn throughout my life, that's because the entire world was designed for people like me. I made this I made this point I think two weeks ago at at the uh, talk that I was with with a game designer named Colleen Macklin and. If you look at it that way, like if I'm if I'm in a position of privilege, I don't need safe zone stickers because it's never been unsafe for me. I've never had to have any kind of symbolism that makes me feel like I'm accepted. I assume I'm accepted, right? right? And and that's why I think, like for example, if you drive down any typical American neighborhood street, you'll probably see American flags hanging from the house, right? 
and and occasionally you might see a pride flag that's like an outlier but in some ways like having an american flag is just as overt a message as having a pride flag right um so i think that does clarify what it means to queer a design and i'm wondering if and you don't have to answer this but i'm wondering if if enough social progress can be made where we don't need symbols uh or signs and and that design becomes more inclusive in a sense that you know all everyone is in, included in it and you don't need any sort of it can become more um elegant and it doesn't need stickers on it it could be you know just because by virtue of it we all accept it and we're all accepted in it i feel like society has to change in order for that to happen it's it's bigger than yes yeah and i i'm with you i would love to eventually get to this utopia where yeah. i just have to question whether or not i'm walking into a space that's safe for myself yeah. just by looking around and finding a safe zone sticker not that that's the end all be all and like right. means that that person is truly an ally or truly a safe person to be out and about with gotcha um but it's concerning now, especially with a lot of other states passing anti-trans care legislation, mm -hmm. um, denying youth and adult gender affirming care. Yep. Um, you know, so really when you're in places like that, you have to find these communities and spaces. Um, so for example, I was a native New Yorker for 30 years. Um, I'm now pursuing my doctoral degree at the University of Arizona, which meant a move to Tucson, Arizona. Now, prior to the November elections, the state was very red and there was a lot of anti LGBTQ laws that were in the process of being passed. Um, on campus, they allow preachers to preach on campus and basically, you know, if they see any sort of rainbow paraphernalia on me or on any other individual or anything that might indicate or symbolize that we're queer somehow. Right, we're the ones that are zeroed in, locked in, and we're told essentially that we're going to hell, which I mean, is not something I have not, not been told in my lifetime growing up Catholic. But, you know, it is important in these turbulent times as this country tries to find its way in negotiating care and space for us as LGBTQ individuals. And as we try to carve that and find that for ourselves in our communities, what do these queer designed and safe spaces look like? But I would love to get to a time where I don't have to have those as questions in the forefront. Well, it, it make you know, it just occurs to me, uh, we were just talking about flags, right? Flags, including our flag, the American flag, the Confederate flag, the, um, uh, the pride flag, but also just the history of flags and sigils all they all go back to a more tribal and more feudal time when pe people were like like identity and un and understanding friends from enemies was a matter of life and death it was like a more militaristic time where violence was really the go-to and that it actually then it makes sense because if queer and non-gender conforming trans etc people are under attack in this country they do need to sort of assume a militarist stance in order to like to defend themselves right i mean they are literally aggressed against and there is structural violence designed into our system against them so that it makes total sense to have a flag in that sense because it's all they're in a defensive position so that that all makes total sense to me when i see it from that from that perspective yeah um so just something to think about while moving forward. And when we think about, you know, largely either at Lehman or in higher ed in general or in our specific respective departments, yeah. you know, how are we designing these spaces? Because a lot of people will say, well, I'm not a designer. So when I picked out, you know, the couch cushions or when I laid out, you know, the furniture in the lobby a certain way, you know, I just thought it looked good or I went with our budget. Yeah. But what people don't realize that even if it's unintentional or you don't think that you're a designer, right, just by selecting or not selecting certain aspects of that space, you create a design, you mm -hmm. create 
a vibe you create you know or give people the sense of whether or not they're welcomed in a space right so if i look at my disabled identity um you know by going into a space where there isn't automatic doors and fighting with the door for me that's signaling that i might not necessarily be welcomed or thought of in that space and i mean i understand that automatic doors are <laughs> not exactly the cheapest item that one right. can afford especially if you're a school that relies on state or city funding yeah right and you're given a specific budget but you know the idea of pushing back and how do you make those spaces more inclusive when it comes to design for queer individuals queer disabled individuals queer people of color Queer people who are also trans, queer people of varying social classes. Yeah. yeah. Because again, it goes back to that we're not just one specific identity. So in addition to space, I wanted us to also think about the products that we use and where we're getting these products and what we're using. So I want us all to think about a product that we use daily, and it could be anything. Um, and now think about the following questions as we're thinking about this product that we have selected, right? So what is it? How do you use it? Who is the traditional user? And how can it be redesigned with queerness in the forefront? I love playing this game of moving my little chat bar around so that it doesn't block <laughs> everything. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's very much a lot of fun. So, uh, <laughs> But yeah, so when we think about objects, I'm not just, you know, I'm thinking about everyday objects. I'm thinking about things that we might gender, right? I'm thinking about things mm -hmm. that we might classify for people who are non-disabled or maybe things that we use or don't use depending on our social classes and if we have access to things like cars, right? So if I was to think of an object, I might think of, clothing right and when we design clothing who are we designing for yeah so like for example traditionally the sweater that i'm wearing was typically marked in the woman's section of a store um but there's really nothing about it if i look at the sweater that i'm wearing i mean it's kind of like a sweater sweatshirt combo it's a, what we would consider a gender neutral color right yeah like, associate gray with either being male or female or trans or non-binary or what have you but then if this is the case then why when we go into stores is there a men's section over here and a women's section over here or a girl's section over here and a boy's section over here and then why are all the pinks and purples and pastels that we traditionally associate with let's say springtime or easter in the women or girls section and then when you get to the men and the boys it's the earthy tones it's like the darker versions of these colors so okay you might not see a lot of pink but you'll see red you might not see baby blue but you'll see the navy blue like when you think of the new york yankees or the royal blue when you think of the mets yeah um so yeah. Really thinking about Dor dorothy uh says here I, she likes my pink shirts i just want to point out that i'm wearing a pink <laughs> top today i feel like i have to <laughs> I saw that and when I, when I signed on, I was like, it's almost like Dave knows. <laughs> it, worked, yeah. it was odd because I, I think it's important because I do own, I love bright colors. I'm a designer, so I like colors and I right. celebrate them. I, I don't, I try not to gender them. Uh, and, but today when I put it on, I had no forethought about why I was doing it. I said, oh, I'll just wear this. I've been wearing it a couple of days. I like to wear, you know, things for a few days in a row. And like, I, it was sort of an afterthought. And I feel like that is um, perhaps also an act of privilege because I can do that. Like I can, uh, as a, as a man, as a, you know, if I'm gendered, gendering myself as a man, I can kind of get away with choices, you know, in a way that maybe someone who identifies as a woman can't. Right. And it's all kinds of choices, not just what I'm wearing, but um, I just think that's interesting. I mean, I was, you were talking about like some of the laws that some of the states are passing, and I think it was Missouri that just passed a law in their, their assembly that uh, barred, um, basically required uh, women uh, to wear 
uh, dresses, like they can't wear pants. And which just seems so like out, right out of the early 20th century or maybe the 19th century. But these are these are real things that are happening around us in in the country by design. Like a, when somebody or a group of somebody's passes a law, that law was designed with a certain objective in mind. Um, and, and and it's it's a people think about it and they create the law and they they design it and then they pass it. So I it's like there are active movements against people that sort of are queer or they split outside the the gender binary it's real it's happening it's like in our faces absolutely um and you're right to point out privilege that a lot of us who are either cisgender or even those that pass really well yeah. um, like i do identify as non-binary but of course due to the way my body looks yeah um i'm often perceived as female mm -hmm. so when i go into spaces and i use let's say the women's bathroom mm -hmm. right i'm not looked at like i have 25 heads because okay well you look like a woman therefore you must be a woman therefore you can use this bathroom right but i was out to dinner last night with my two friends one of them is a cis female and the other one is a trans woman and when she got up to use the bathroom apparently she had ran into our waitress in the bathroom who reacted with i don't know if it was surprise disgust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or whatever we want to call it at the yeah. fact that my trans friend was using a restroom that aligns with her gender identity right um and then when we think of products to go back to the clothes right you know we're not explicitly saying oh well you have to be xyz body type to wear these clothes but we demonstrate it in the models that we use for these oh. ads and in magazines and yeah you know what we show in the store we demonstrate it by sectioning off okay if you wear this then therefore you must be this particular box yeah if you wear that you're in this other box right so the way in which we design products intentional or not is there right and it dictates a way in which it's either very queer friendly or it's not so queer friendly yeah um, and just for us to keep thinking about these things as we go on. And I'm not saying that after we all get off this talk, we're gonna, you know, storm the stars and start, you know, being sections to be redone or, you know, putting the blue overalls where the pink ones once were and going to swap, like, but I want us to be consciously thinking about this and observing this as we go into these places that are very traditionally gendered, right? And clothing stores and restrooms are only two examples. There are plenty out there, but those are the most obvious and usually the ones that are brought into question okay. um so now when i was preparing for this presentation of course it dawned on me that i am one queer individual with one set of ideas or things that i think would work or should work in an ideal world so i did take a moment to reach out to other queer identifying friends i put out my feelers on social media and we came up with a wish list of sorts if we were to think of the ideal ideal society if we were to think of design as this concept that had queerness in its forefront as we were designing spaces and clothing and artwork and all these other things basically anything and everything that goes into design um so someone that i pulled said well what about asking about pronouns right so the same way when we introduce ourselves we ask people's name, maybe we'll ask them where they're from, or if we're in a classroom with our students, we might ask like, what's your major? What are you studying? Just incorporating or inviting the idea of asking about pronouns or allowing people to share their pronouns there, right? Because traditionally in a binary gendered society, we have this idea of you're either male or you're female, and we don't think about anything that might be in the middle or on the outskirts or interchangeable. Right, so really thinking about this idea of who people are. Um, someone else said that they wanted to feel comfortable enough to talk openly about their significant others and partners. So this came from a friend of mine who is a practicing lawyer in Georgia, who also happens to be a lesbian. And she was saying that she was talking to a client and her client had mentioned something about her husband. And you know, my friend had to stop herself from saying, oh, you know, my fiance and I, or my girlfriend and I, or we're gonna go do this because she was afraid that it would sour the relationship she had built with the client. She was afraid that 
maybe that client would go to her boss and try to get her fired. I mean, Georgia is also known as a state that's pretty conservative and takes stances on this that are aligned pretty conservatively. I don't know if that's true of her law firm. She didn't get yeah. into that. But that was something that was um, on the forefront for her. Another non-binary friend of mine said they wanted free accessible health care. So something on their wish list in terms of medical transition is this idea of top surgery. Um, so for anyone who's unfamiliar, for those of us, AFABs are assigned female at birth. Obviously, when we hit puberty, our chest kind of changes and society at large uses that as a telltale sign to keep us in that female box. And for some of us, that works well because we identify as female or we like to be femme presenting. For other people, mm. such as my friend who suggested this, um, this doesn't work so well and it creates a lot of gender dysphoria for her. It creates a lot of tension within her family. Um, and top surgery is not one of those surgeries that you can just waltz into a hospital and say, hi, I would like to you know, make an appointment and have them you know, deal with this next week. Um, depending on the state that you're in, a lot of these gender affirming care surgeries, you have to have different letters of recommendation, so to speak, from a doctor you have to have um, basically have gone through a psychological evaluation that basically says that you're not sick, quote unquote. Um, and this could be as simple for things as top surgery or bottom surgery or even a legal name change. Like in Arizona, if I wanted to pursue a legal name change, I basically have to jump through metaphorical hoops. Yeah. I have to get a primary care physician to write a letter and sign off on it. And it has to be very specifically worded saying that essentially like medically they have tried to convince me not to do this, but it's not a medical thing, it's something else. Plus, you know, proving that I want other gender affirming care. Some states want you to be on hormones for a certain amount of time, even though gender non-conforming or expansive individuals might not necessarily want hormone therapy. Um, so those are, you know, my friend who was suggesting this wishes that there was free accessible healthcare and there wasn't all these hoops to jump through. So those, just to stop you there, those hoops are, uh, they're laws, right? Aren't these, yeah. okay. So again, here's like an example of, you were you you and I were talking prior in the past about how sociology sort of like critiques the systems we're embedded with, embedded in. Um, the systems to a large part that we're embedded in, in this country at any rate, are, they exist because of laws, right? Like we are, we're, we're a nation of laws as everyone is um, so fond of saying. So, so it seems like from a system design standpoint, those laws, those hoops, as you're calling them, mm -hmm. are there to, the only objective is to inhibit, it's to gatekeep, mm -hmm. right? And it's funny because like, well, it's not funny, but it's odd and strange because those laws are generally passed by the party of like, you know, less government, you know, the smallest, the least government is the, the best. And, and yet here we are with racks of different laws about that they're really their only objective is to regulate and stop and gatekeep. And I, I just find that really interesting. And, um, uh, as far as that, as a as an item on the wish list goes, I'm wondering, just because of the way our legal system works and legislative systems work, right. I wonder if there really is a way, if it's even possible to redesign the system from the ground up so it, it doesn't even have to do that. It, there doesn't have to be a deconstruction of all these sort of draconian laws, because that's really what we're looking at, right? We're looking at a slow process of elections and new legislation and the, the culture changes and that, you know, creates new laws, which changes culture more. Is it even possible from a design standpoint? I'm just wondering. Um, I mean, I think it can be possible in the sense of a lot of healthcare options are left up to the state right okay. so depending on where you live some of these places might be safer quote unquote or more accepting to do so so for example down the road should i want to pursue top surgery i would probably be coming back to new york for that sure because a lot of my here's where we have intersecting identities a lot of my medical complexities associated with disability 
are on record at NYU or New York University Hospital and have been for my whole entire three decades of existence. And so a lot of my other doctors would now have to know that I want top surgery so they can communicate with the doctors and make sure that whatever is being done for the top surgery would not necessarily interfere with some of the other medical surgeries and things and devices that I have going on. Yeah. Right. So that for me would be an easy, all right, if I want this, I'm coming back to New York. Yeah. Um, because for me, there's less red tape. There's less of an issue, right? But for yeah. someone else, you know, who right. lives in a state that is passing laws that will deny them being either youth or an adult, yeah. gender affirming care, they're going to have to say, okay, well, I live in Tennessee and like that's just not going to happen. So I'm going to have to go to New York or another state that would allow me to do so. Right. Um, so for now, you know, since it's very hard to, especially because a lot of healthcare laws and things like that are state regulated, for now, it's less about redesigning from the ground up because really you'd have to do that 50 different times. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unless some sort of federal government intervention happens. <laughs> which depending on who's in power at the time yeah. and what party has leads, you may or may not want that to happen. Right. For now, it's this look at, you know, who are the safe space, right? Or the queer states or the queer spaces within the states that will allow these things to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, similar to that, another friend of mine spoke about how gender affirming surgery should be mastered like other plastic surgeries. So the same way we're very keen on nose jobs or butt implants or breast reductions or enhancements, mm -hmm. where is this in gender affirming surgery? Yeah. We're not too specific or we're not as, you know, design savvy or design concerned when we're doing, let's say, for example, gender affirming bottom surgery is what yeah. this particular individual was referring to. Yeah. Um, not only for the aesthetic, but also for the function of what these parts are also supposed to do yeah. and enhance. Um, and then lastly, when I was reflecting on what I would want on this list, yeah. in addition to, because I'm all for what my friends were saying and suggesting, um, I think we also need civil open conversations around gender neutral language. Someone, someone tells you that their pronouns are they, them, instead of giving them a whole lecture on how that's grammatically incorrect in the English language, we start having conversations that have to deal with comfort and acknowledging someone's existence and acknowledging their identity and seeing them for who they are. Because yeah. once you have family and friends or colleagues or professors or whoever that give this whole, well, they, them is not, you know, it's for more of a plural person, um, you know, I can't refer to you as that because you're one person. And then sometimes we'll you tie in the, transphobia with the ableism in the sense of usually when I get these comments about my they them pronouns I'll get something like well there's not two of you unless you know maybe you're bipolar and are you talking or schizophrenic and you're talking about your alternate identity so right there I'm hit with a one-two punch because now you're tackling and taking down my gender identity as a non-binary person but you're also hitting into disability. Now, I personally yeah. don't identify with and wasn't diagnosed with any mental illnesses, but I can imagine that there are people who identify somewhere on the gender expansive spectrum and also might have some mental illnesses to deal with. So, you know, right there, just by acknowledging or not acknowledging, you know, language that's been in the English language for centuries. Yeah you're also attacking someone else's identity. Well, um, also that person's relying on the gender binary that's built into the English language to make the argument, right? right? It's like that the, the language is as language does is the normative structure, right? So if you're then using the English language, which changes every, you know, every day really, mm -hmm. and, and has fluctuated in the past and will again, and it's really a hodgepodge of like five different languages, right? If you're using that as like 
uh, you know, the well to draw from to attack people's identity or usage of their language, it's 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 kind of like a cowardly move to do something like that. Because it, it's interesting in researching this this idea of gender neutral language, uh, which again the English language with its um, Germanic and Romantic roots, mm -hmm. it, it admittedly is not built for that. Um, uh, I did discover that there are gender neutral languages in the world, right? right? Basque, for example, which is in the northern part of Spain, Finnish, Estonian, oddly enough, but also something that was that snuck out at me is that right now, specifically just this year and last year, the whole like CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, and right. it's you know it was the it was the silly you know pageantry that you'd imagine, but there was a lot of talk about pronouns and attacking the usage of exactly what you're talking about, gender neutral language. So you can imagine that this is going to um, this is going to be in the ether for the next decade at least, right? Uh, it's under attack. Um, and, and I think that the attacks are built on this theory or this feeling, fear really, that if we start talking, if we start speaking in gender neutral languages, it'll confuse people. It'll confuse them and turn us, this country, our society into some kind of godless, genderless, you know, confusing situation. But then, um, Another language that's gen that's gender neutral is Hungarian, and Hungary just happens to be one of the most fascist right wing countries right now in in Europe. And actually, their their president Viktor Orban is um, also ardently against any sort of you know uh, uses of pronouns. L the LGBT community there is in fear of their life, uh, very very intolerant. Uh, on things such as that, disabilities, he's been outspoken on. Um, so it's like, it doesn't, it's, it's funny because like, again, here is a system, a language based system in which, you know, it has all these things that you would want out of a language, it's gender neutral structures. And yet the society in which it exists in, the system in which the language sort of lives in, couldn't be more backwards. You know, couldn't and it's more antithetical antithetical to progress than our our own country is or or in some pockets. So it it really it just kind of shows that the language. It's funny. It's like it's difficult to tell whether the language really has anything to do with it or not. I I can't make that call. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, I mean, I would say that, I mean, languages in their origins are built with this inherently or not inherently in mind, and they're designed to address specific identities. Um, but I think what's happening, particularly when we think of pronouns and gender expansive individuals, right? So the trans and non-binary and agender and gender fluid people and et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, pronouns, for example, were always in the English language, right? I right. mean, when you learn the parts of speech as an elementary school child, you were learning this is a preposition, and this is a verb, this is right. a noun, right? This is a pronoun. These are not things that we were not teaching our children that suddenly sprang up in the last decade when no. No. expansive people showed up. What's happening now is that it's less about language, I would argue, and it's more about the political statements that we're using pronouns and making them out yes. the same way we talked about flag symbolism right yeah. these pronouns and our choices in using these pronouns or not are becoming a political statement like for example i was visiting my dad a few months ago and um my dad for not to get political is a very a love of fox news for right this right um like he watches all of those individuals and he had happened to fall asleep and he lives in a little studio apartment so as i'm working i ha he has the tv on and i hear one of them conflating this idea of gender um expansive identity and pronouns and conflating this idea of image descriptions that a lot of people use for people who are blind and visually impaired 
and basically saying how, you know, he sees that this is ridiculous, that we're worried about what people identify as, and now we have to go as far as to identify every aspect of a human in a social media post. And it's like, well, you're doing that because there are people who use screen readers who can't tell that, you know, right. Dave is a white man wearing a pink shirt with dark hair. <laughs> right. You have to spell that out. But in no way are we trying to say, well, Dave is a cisgender or non-cisgender individual. Yeah. Um, so we're giving language this political infusion that if we really boil it down and we strip away politics from it, right? right. What you're doing is utilizing what's already been in the language. Like right. singular they has been in the English language for centuries, but yeah. we do that when gender presumably is either unknown or not involved. So for example, when parents are expecting a baby, you'll hear statements like, oh, I hope they are happy and healthy when they're born. Well, okay, why can't we just do that for individuals that exist in the world but the second we either know the biological sex of the child or the second that we see a person's body, we put these assumptions into yeah. everything that we do. And we totally, you know, get engrossed in the gender that is embedded in our society and mm -hmm. putting us into these binaries. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, it's less about language and more about the politics that we're infusing into things okay. that are already there or not there in these languages gotcha gotcha there's a question here about uh are there some designers in any of the design spaces fashion architecture media design graphic design who are doing this right and who are the design leaders we should be looking at i understand i mean you don't work as a, as a designer per se but the other the follow-up is are there examples of spaces and products that we should study that that are more gender inclusive um, or gender expansive. Do you have any things that come to mind? Yeah. So I mean, I would look for designers that are thinking about these things, whether they identify as queer or not in some level, you know, that's here neither here nor there, but it also has a lot to do with where they're working as well. So for example, if you're looking and we're getting your design inspiration from you know, Hobby Lobby or yeah. Chick-fil-A, those are places that inherently have anti-LGBTQ or queer um, agendas, which means that they're probably really not investing or thinking about designing their products yeah. with the queer community in mind, right? right. So right. doing your research on who you're inspired by, where they're getting their inspiration, who they're affiliated with, and just really being conscious of you know, what they're doing. In terms of products, um, a lot of product lines for, you know, it could be argued, and that's a whole other talk, whether this is capitalism speaking, or that they are obviously genuinely want to be yeah. inclusive, but of if course, you're yeah. looking around the month of June, right, yeah. almost every clothing company, shoe company, bag company, Yep. You're doing something related to the LGBTQ community. Yep. Coach has a rainbow pride collection. Disney has a pride collection. Um, Converse has, you could design or order, you know, pride sneakers with your appropriate pride flag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, so those are companies, depending on where they're getting their inspiration from, that arguably one can say they're doing it right because now you have the option to literally wear your identity. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, on the one hand, that's what we call rainbow consumerism, which is essentially they're taking this idea of Pride Month and being prideful and celebrating who you are and turning it into a commodity. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, it's also like I literally get to wear on my sleeve the non binary pride flag and I can really show who I am. And, you know, if people don't know what the pride, what that flag symbolizes, we can have that conversation and that dialogue. But then you also have to think about and go back to the safety and why you're having that conversation and why you're wearing that in the first place. So there are places and designers and people out there. You just have to look at where they're at, where they're getting their inspiration from. And also, are they genuinely an ally or are they using this, meaning, you know, LGBTQ pride and identity as a way just to make money? Yeah. It's, um, it's funny. We'll, we'll have to, we'll have to leave it there, but, um, I did want to just put in the chat uh, a really good source for 
all things having to do with queer and non-binary uh, and LGBTQIA plus issues is the human rights uh, campaign. Right. They're a non-for-profit. You may have seen people on the street with a clipboard asking for your signature, please sign. But uh, I'm gonna put in the chat here, just their shop because I, I've gotten like mugs from them before. Like I have like, like, you know, they're like, I have the love is love mugs, but they're actually one place that does have pretty progressive design product, product design. So I'm just going to throw that there, but, um, I mean, their shop is good. And also just one quick thing. And it's yeah. questions I have here. Look for, um, mom and pop designers go on Etsy. If you're going to buy something and right. see who the queer designers are, go to your local flea markets. I mean, I know that's the thing in Arizona. I don't know how much of that is still in New York, but we have openly queer designed flea markets. So every booth you go to, oh. no who you're buying from and what you're buying, you're buying queer. Yeah. So look at who those local designers are, check out their stuff, have them, you know, conversate with them and really engage with them would be my last thing. Cool. All right, well, this has been eye-opening as always. Uh, thank you, Danny, and uh, thank you for meeting with us. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what's what's going on in your in your accessible design class. So we'll have to, we'll have to chat at another time about that. I'm really excited. But um, thank you again, and everybody, thanks for coming and being open and asking questions. And um, I will see everybody next week when we continue the uh, lecture series. And everybody, have a great day. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And of course, my email is right here in case you do have follow up questions or you want to engage in conversation further. Great. Thank you, Danny. Have a good one, okay? Thank you. You too. All right. Bye bye.